Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr Alper Ake, based at the Gurdon Institute at the University of Cambridge to discuss his recent open access paper published in Open Biology. The study focuses on the role of proteins as regulators of gene expression and looks at the relevance of such complex regulatory mechanisms in organisms. Alper, what was the initial purpose of the study? Uh, the initial purpose of our study was to, um, to find uh, genetic interactors of uh, GOLD1. Uh, GOLD1 is a RNA binding protein that regulates uh, several targets uh, during C. elegans uh, germline development and it's an essential gene. So if you remove this gene, the animals become sterile and uh, they don't produce any more progeny. Um, previously, um, in our lab, uh, we found that if you um, have a special sensitive mutation in the GOLD1 gene, these animals were no longer sterile, but they uh, only lacked regulation of, few, of a few target genes. And, um, and this uh, mutation was also temperature sensitive, which means that if you, if you grow these animals at the um, permissive temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, the animals were like wild type animals. However, if you start now growing them at higher temperatures, they became sterile. So um, we took advantage of this uh, sensitivity and we uh, decided to do a whole genome RNA screen. So in C. elegans, there's this nice feature that you can feed the uh, animals with uh, bacteria that expresses double-strand RNA and that triggers uh, RNA interference response and then uh, leads to the silencing of the target genes. Um, so there is this uh, uh, RNA library for of 18,000 genes, and um, so we targeted all these genes one by one by feeding the worms with uh, bacteria, and look for genes that, when you knock down, specifically leads to sterility in the sensitive gold one mutation, uh, but not in the uh, wild type animals. And this led to the discovery of several genes that specifically enhance this sterility. And we think these are important because uh, these genes might be the genes that uh, function together with GOLD1 in the same pathway. And uh, this way we think we identified uh, some new interactions that might lead now to uh, future studies. And what are the roles of microRNAs and RNA binding proteins? The role of microRNAs and uh, uh, RNA binding proteins are uh, quite the same. They both regulate gene expression. MicroRNAs are small endogenous non-coding RNAs, usually about 2 to 2 nucleotide long, and they interact with the proteins called argonaut proteins, and then they find their targets by sequence complementarity, and uh, either repress the translation of these messenger RNAs, or they lead to destabilization of these RNAs and lead to degradation. And um, so. MicroRNAs also then interact with several other proteins after they uh, form, uh, then they form this complex called the microRNA in this silencing complex. And uh, several uh, of these microRNA in the silencing complex proteins are required for proper function and uh, how the microRNAs interact with their targets. Uh, we, we know a lot about the, uh, uh, how the microRNAs are uh, produced, how their biogenesis mechanism is but we still uh, don't understand exactly how they lead to uh, target repression. There are several studies showing that uh, different mechanisms uh, can take uh, action, but we don't know exactly which, uh, how these decisions are made. Uh, we also know a lot about uh, what the microRNAs can target, but we still lag behind on identifying their endogenous uh, targets. And that's because uh, microRNAs uh, can have several hundred targets but that depends whether they are all expressed in the same tissues or in the same cells, and um, that's quite a big challenge. For RNA binding proteins, uh, it's even uh, more difficult because they have much more diverse functions. So from the transcription of the messenger RNA to its degradation, you need RNA binding proteins in every step. Um, you need uh, RNA binding proteins for, the, for splicing, for polyadenylation, for nuclear export. And then there is a subset of RNA binding proteins that function in translational regulation. And um, usually these RNA binding proteins recognize a certain sequence or a structure in the RNA. And similar to uh, microRNAs, they can lead to target repression. But there are also RNA binding proteins which are required for activation of translation or just the stabilization of uh, mRNAs. Um, 
Again, much of the research so far has focused uh, mostly on uh, identifying the target sequence for these RNA binding proteins. And we now have an idea what these uh, proteins do recognize, but we still don't understand which other proteins they interact with and how they actually lead to uh, target repression or activation. So why did you choose C. elegans as a model for your study? C. elegans is a great model organism because uh, you, you can do genetics uh, very uh, easily, uh, especially doing genetic screens uh, has been the most powerful uh, thing in, in C. elegans. Um, as I mentioned before, we can do these whole genome RNAi screens. You can knock genes down uh, very easily in C. elegans, but you can also do mutagenesis screens where you randomly mutate the genes and look for the effects uh, of these mutations. Uh, another advantage of C. elegans and using genetic screens is what we did is uh, it's an enhancer screen uh, where you can uh, start with a weak phenotype and then look for uh, genes that are upon uh, knockdown or upon mutation can enhance this phenotype. And such uh, screens usually lead to very uh, subtle interactions that would otherwise uh, wouldn't be discovered. And you can do the same thing uh, for genes that have a very strong phenotype, and you can try to suppress these strong phenotypes by mutation or, uh, or knockdown of another gene. And again, these will lead to uh, genetic interactions that would otherwise uh, wouldn't surface. Um, on top of that, uh, C. elegans uh, is a multicellular organism, even though it's very small, it's a one millimeter length. But um, it has different tissue types, and it has a very uh, determined developmental uh, program. So you can combine all these and design very uh, versatile genetic screens, which can give you information about uh, a lot of biological pathways. Uh, and finally, C. elegans uh, genome uh, is uh, fully sequenced, so we know all the genes in, in C. elegans, and uh, about 50% of these genes are conserved in, uh, in humans. So that's also very important, because then if you do these genetic screens, it's very likely that the things that you find uh, are also relevant to humans. And could you tell us the significance of studying the RNA binding protein GOLD1? Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, GOLD1 is, uh, is an essential uh, gene for, for uh, C. elegans uh, and for proper germline development. Uh, but the other also interesting thing is uh, GOLD1's uh, human homologue, quicken, uh, is also an essential gene. Uh, if you uh, reduce the levels of uh, quirking genes in mice, they, they, they lead to uh, problems in myelination of central nervous uh, system cells. And also if you remove the, this quirking gene in, uh, in mice, uh, that leads to early embryonic lethality because the central nervous system doesn't develop very well. And um, also uh, the reduction of these genes uh, has been linked to diseases such as ataxia and schizophrenia. Um, so it's, it's quite important to understand how these RNA binding proteins function so that we can understand uh, how these diseases progress. And to understand that, we need to understand how these uh, RNA binding proteins do regulate their targets. Um, but so far, as I said earlier, that most of the focus has been on, on trying to identify uh, targets, sequences. But to find the real endogenous targets is, uh, can be quite problematic. And uh, C. elegans uh, has this unique advantage of doing the screens. And we are hoping that some of these interactions we identify for gold one might also be relevant for quicken. And what we have shown in our paper that uh, gold one uh, interacts now with the microRNA pathways might be quite important uh, for how quicken also functions. Because now, instead of having one regulatory factor regulating a target, now we have multiple factors. So we have to keep this in mind. And actually recently some other uh, uh, papers showed that quirkin also interacts with microRNA pathways, showing that these systems are actually really conserved. So what does the research presented in your paper add to the existing knowledge of GOLD1? We knew a lot about uh, GOLD1's role in germline development, uh, which targets it regulates at which developmental stages. Um, but what we didn't understand is how it really functions uh, when it finds its target, uh, which other proteins it interacts with. And um, the reason for that was that we didn't have any uh, tool to do screens because most of gold one mutations were leading to very strong uh, phenotypes. They were all sterile. So you couldn't really study uh, uh, 
this genetic sequence because it's very tricky when you have a lethal or sterile mutation. However, once we uh, identified this spatial sensitive gold one mutant, uh, we could now perform a genetic screen. And, um, and our screen uh, discovered that the gold one interacts uh, genetically at least with other RNA binding proteins. And it will be very interesting to study in the future how these um, uh, RNA binding proteins really function together with gold one, whether they regulate the same targets or, or they just func uh, they function in the same pathway. Uh, on top of that, so in our screen we identified two proteins that were already known modulators of microRNA function. And then we decided to pursue this link uh, between gold one and, and microRNA pathway. And in our paper, uh, through extensive genetic experiments, we show that gold one uh, strongly interacts with different microRNA pathways. It really called this sensitive gold one mutation and other gold one mutations enhance the phenotypes of microRNA pathway genes. And, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is quite important that we now uh, have to think for future studies that uh, GOLD1 is not uh, uh, the sole regulator of its targets, but perhaps uh, it functions with microRNAs either in the same pathway or acting on the same RNAs. So you've touched on it briefly already, but what's the next step in your own research? So the next thing uh, to do is to really understand how GOLD1 and the microRNAs uh, function together, um, especially uh, if they uh, do really regulate the same subset of targets, it will be interesting to see how at the molecular level this happens. So we tried to use this uh, latest uh, technique in, in proteomics to look at global changes uh, in protein levels in the whole organisms. And we did this in, um, in GOLD1 and, uh, and the microRNA mutant backgrounds. And in this system, we I tried to identify the changes in the proteins uh, when you remove GOLD1 and the microRNA. And we identified that at least one gene uh, called CDL1 might be in part responsible for the phenotypes we observe. And interestingly, this gene was uh, already identified as a gold one target and it's a predicted uh, let 7 microRNA target. So it will be interesting to see actually if, uh, if this gene is really uh, at the molecular level co-regulated with these uh, two systems. Or, uh, or gold one and microRNAs are actually regulating different genes at the, at the same pathway at different times. So um, this will be, I think, be the next step for this research. But in general, I think uh, we are, have been in the field focusing too much on trying to identify target sequences, but we need to uh, focus a bit more on uh, how different systems and translation regulatory mechanisms do interact, because I think uh, RNAs uh, are uh, not solely occupied by one mechanism or the other. They are uh, co-occupied with different regulatory proteins and uh, other machineries. So we need to un understand how these interactions do happen. Thank you, Alpa, and thank you for watching another Royal Society publishing video podcast.